Technical Ecstasy is rather an interesting album. Uh, the, many of the members of the band thought it was very good. Ozzy actually said uh, it was a very enjoyable album to make. At least <laughs> Tony Iommi enjoyed it because he made it. So uh, I think he felt that it was a Tony Iommi solo album in some respects. But uh, it certainly was a period when the band could kind of forget about all the management hassles they'd been enduring up to that point. And various courtroom battles and uh, all the problems that affect a band on the road. They just kind of forgot about that with technical ecstasy and concentrated on the music. So uh, certainly uh, Geezer and, and uh, Tony Iommi thought it was a great album. Whether Ozzy did is debatable. <laughs> uh, the critics were uh, mixed in their reviews. Uh, Malcolm Dome of Kerrang, who was a top uh, heavy metal writer, thought that uh, the band had lost their way a bit with that album. Technical Ecstasy is a, a disappointment. It doesn't really sound like Sabbath knew what they wanted to do. They seemed to know what they didn't want to do. They wanted to move forward but weren't quite sure how to do it. And th there's nothing on that album that really makes you feel, this is quite astonishing. This is a great song. Shame it got lost in the whole of the rest of the album. <laughs> They did two albums after Sabotage, and and they, you could clearly see they were a band falling apart. The last two records that they recorded with Ozzy weren't great by a long shot. Some of them wound up on drugs and all the rest of it. And, and Ozzy, Ozzy went, whichever way he went, he went, and, and he was gone in a lot of ways for quite some years, I think. It just wasn't working, things just wasn't happening. We were ended up recording for 11, well, rehearsing for 11 months, and nothing was coming up. So we'd come up with plenty of riffs and stuff, but no, there was no enthusiasm. So it just, it just had to come to an end and uh, we had to have a talk. So it's not going to happen. And um, it was the time when Ozzy went then. I think at that time he was going through a lot of problems himself and, and uh, we needed to sort of get away from each other and we needed to do our own thing, I think. Or he certainly needed to do his own thing. By that time, Ozzy was out of control. He was drinking too much, taking too many drugs unhappy and the whole thing was just a mess and he was fired after that album. Let's face it, Black Sabbath is a great, they are, there's four individuals that make a great band but they've also got, and this is the word, frontman. They've got one of the best frontman ever to grace a stage and they've lost him. They've lost him and what the hell are you going to do? When Ozzy left Black Sabbath, I think it, for a lot of people it was almost unthinkable that they could carry on. Ozzy Osbourne, of course, was quite literally irreplaceable. You just couldn't find somebody to fill his shoes. The singers are the, the hardest people to replace and you couldn't get a complete replacement for Ozzy because Ozzy is so unique. Now, Ronnie James Dio, perhaps on paper, wouldn't have appeared like the ideal choice to front Black Sabbath, he'd um, been sacked from Rainbow um, and was toying around with some other musical things and didn't really know what he was doing and they got a call and they hooked up. The strange thing is, somebody reminded me recently, the person who suggested Ronnie James Dio to Sabbath was Sharon Osbourne, or Sharon Arden as she was then. Now whether she meant it as a joke, I don't know, but it was an incredibly piece, incredible piece of planning incredible piece of suggestion if you want. It would have looked very odd um, and certainly because of Ozzy's strong image and, and, and the way that image was linked to Black Sabbath the band. But you only have to listen to Heaven and Hell to know that this is a marriage made in heaven. It worked great I and mean, straight away it was like life into the band again by just bringing somebody new in. The, the sparkle was there again, it was really exciting. Everybody was like really ready to go again by whom somebody put something into it. You know. I don't think that there was a better choice of singer. I don't think anybody else could have gone in and pulled off walking into Ozzy's shoes as well and as creatively and with such a bombastic approach as Ronnie Dio did. Some of the things we had already written uh, when Ronnie, before Ronnie came. Uh, so his involvement was, was good really because he came come up with a few other ideas to add to the songs. I think it was a risk for them to bring someone in 
who sounded like he did because he wasn't the Aussie replacement. He was clearly going to make the band a very, very different band. Of course, the way he'd sing, he's a totally different singer to Aussie, so the way he'd approach things was a lot more operatic, if you like, so it, it helped a lot for us. He was a good choice, but he wasn't Ozzy Osbourne, never really wanted to be. He was Ronnie James Dio, and a phenomenally good singer at that. Ronnie James Dio is one of the greatest rock singers of all time, um, and almost anything he lends his voice to has a very classy sort of sound to it. He clearly had a lot of influence in the band, in the writing, the sound. He transformed Black Sabbath, and, and I think he transformed it from a dying band um, into a quite a vibrant, musical entity. They went from being more of a sort of straight ahead metal band to they developed this more kind of like more of a heavy rock sound, very melodic, still very heavy as well um, over the whole album. But Neon Knights is a good example that you know they, they, they were heavy but very melodic and evidently it was going to work and it was going to and it worked very very well. Die Young was a good song, one of the better ones from the Heaven and Hell album and I think it worked because um, it was, it was vibrant, it was fast, powerful, um, and fantastic vocals from Ronnie James Dio. It's very difficult to pinpoint what would be the greatest song of, of, of that era, but that's got to be in there, definitely Die Young. Fantastic song. If you're talking about a Black Sabbath anthem from the Ronnie Dio era, if you're talking about a, an anthem from the 1980s, this is it. This is a great, coruscating, brilliant piece of music. I mean, musically, Sabbath, the whole sort of sound changed. They sounded tired, a tired band from the two albums that preceded Heaven and Hell. But Heaven and Hell comes out at the height of resurgence of interest in heavy metal with, through the new wave of British heavy metal in the UK. And Heaven and Hell comes out and is an instant hit. I'm a great believer in a band with the original lineup is the only band that can exist. And although it was slick, it was professional, it sounded great, it looked great, it just wasn't even close. This guy has created a different, slightly different sounding Black Sabbath, but one that's no less appealing. He brought baggage with him. He was a known quantity, but he certainly did manage to add to the Sabbath legend without taking too much away. Ronnie James Dio was a good choice to, re to replace anybody or to be himself. But he sure as hell wasn't Ozzy Osbourne and didn't try to be, and that about him I admire.